part of the course requirements for Biology 317, you will be expected to produce a professional quality insect collection. This collection must be submitted by the end of the course. To be able to do this, you will need to know some of the rules and procedures that are followed in producing a museum quality collection. This tape is designed to introduce you to the basics of pinning, pointing, spreading, alcohol preservation, and microslide preservation. This cricket is an example of an insect that can be pinned with very little difficulty. Unfortunately, you see here a damaged specimen. Note the antennae. With the specimens you hand in, we will expect to be perfect. In order to proceed with the pinning operation, you will need to remember the three body regions of the insect, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The pin will be inserted perpendicular to the body in the thorax, just to the right of the midline. The insect pin is inserted into the specimen. Once the pin has emerged from the underside, it can be set to the correct height on a pinning block. The pinning block consists of three sides, each setting a different part of the specimen to a different height. For the specimen itself, you will use the longest height, pressing the specimen down through the length of the pinning block, and pushing the pin down against a firm surface. When the pin contacts that surface, the insect has been set to the correct height. You will note that this specimen tends to droop a bit. This can be corrected by using another block of styrofoam and setting the specimen onto the block of styrofoam so that its appendages and body regions just touch the block. Limbs can be arranged on the block give a lifelike appearance and so that all the necessary appendages are exposed for examination. In place of the styrofoam, a square of cardboard can be cut out and placed on the pin just underneath the specimen. After a few days, the specimen will have dried enough to be taken off the, pin, off the styrofoam and properly labeled. Like the cricket, this beetle can be pinned directly. However, beetles have a hard forewing called an elytra. Instead of placing the pin in the thorax as we did with the cricket, the pin is inserted in the anterior portion of the right elytron. In this case, take the pin and push it through the right side of the elytra. Once the pin has just exited the underside of the insect, the pin is placed in the block as we did with the cricket. The pin is again pushed through the full length of the pinning block. In this case, the specimen is fairly rigid and need not be supported on styrofoam or cardboard. The legs can be arranged with a sharp pin for best exposure and the specimen allowed to dry. Although most insects are large enough to be pinned directly, some small ones obviously require some different technique. The technique we use on these fellows is called pointing. Points are these small cardboard triangles which are pre-cut for you and which you will find in your kit. Instead of the insect, the point is mounted on the pin. The pin is inserted through the broad base of the point and the point is set to the correct height on the long side of the pinning block. Using fine forceps, the very tip of the point is bent down at a 90 degree angle. This will create a small triangular surface on which to place a drop of glue.
The glue we use is called shellac gel. This is a product of the lac insect, which obviously makes it a good thing for insects, right? A small drop of the glue is applied to the bent down surface of the point. The point is then touched to the right side of the thorax of the specimen. The result is a correctly pinned specimen. Under higher power, you can see the specimen mounted on the point, the left side of the specimen exposed for examination. Note that the point is attached to the side rather than the bottom of the specimen, so the underside is also visible. With diptera or true flies, it is not necessary to put the specimen on a point, merely placing a drop of glue at the correct location on the pin. In order to properly mount and identify butterflies and moths, the wings need to be spread out so that the full wing venation and the patterning can be seen. This is accomplished by the technique known as spreading. In order to proceed, the specimen is pinned in the normal manner, inserting the pin to the right of midline on the thorax and mounting on the pinning block in the normal way. The pinned insect is then inserted on a spreading board. Commercial wooden ones are available, but for our purposes, we will be using a block of styrofoam, which can be cut to the appropriate dimensions. A groove is cut in the styrofoam to just accommodate the body of the specimen. This is most easily accomplished with your scalpel. The groove should be cut as close to the precise width of the insect's thorax as is feasible. Pieces of glassine or waxed paper should be placed on top of the styrofoam to prevent the butterfly or moth's wing scales from sticking to the surface. These can be lightly pinned in place on each side of the groove that you have cut. The specimen is then inserted in the groove and the wings allowed to rest on the top of the glassine paper. A fine pin, preferably a zero or double zero, is inserted behind the major vein in the front wing and the wing drawn forward. It is important to find a major vein or you're in danger of tearing the wing once the wing has been pulled out so that its hind edge is perpendicular to the body of the insect, it is temporarily pinned in place and the other forewing similarly brought forward. The, wing, the hind wing is now moved into position behind the forewing. It is moved so that its leading edge is at right angles to the body of the insect. You'll notice that I am placing the pin behind a major vein, bringing the wing up so there is a slight overlap between the fore and hind wings, which does not obscure the venation of either. Once the wings are correctly placed, the antennae can be adjusted for best exposure. At this stage, additional pieces of glassine paper are cut to fit over the wings between the pins and the body. These can be pinned in place in such a manner as to hold both the wings and antennae flat while the specimen dries. A minimum number of pins should be placed in the wing itself. This one is being placed between the front and hind wings. The pin holding the front wing can now be removed with safety. The right wing is treated in the same manner. At this stage, the remaining pins can be removed from the hind wings. The specimen is now spread, however, as it dries, there's a tendency for the unsecured outer edges of the wing to curl up. To prevent this, additional glassine paper is now laid across the wing to entirely cover its surface, and pins are placed around the wing to hold it in place. In this particular instance, the abdomen of the insect is riding high above the spreading board. In order to overcome this, an additional strip of glassine paper is placed over the specimen, straddling the wings. This piece of paper will press the abdomen down to the horizontal.
the abdomen is now on a level with the rest of the specimen's body. The specimen may be put aside now for about a week, at which time it will have dried into position and all the pins and glassine paper can be removed. The specimens can then be labeled and placed in the collection. Since it will be unlabeled for some time, it is a good idea to prepare the label and place it alongside the specimen at this time so the specimen and its data don't become separated. Larvae, nymphs, and some soft-bodied adults should be preserved in alcohol rather than pinned. We use 70% ethanol as the preservative in this course. Vials are filled with alcohol to the top so that there is a minimum-sized air bubble in the vial. If the air bubble can be totally eliminated, this is better still. The reason for this is that an air bubble roaming around inside the jar can actually damage the specimen. specimen is placed inside the vial and the cap is applied. Here is the preserved specimen with a small air bubble. This technique is appropriate to use in all immature insects. Nymphs are the more primitive insects. The larvae and pupae of those more advanced insects that undergo complete metamorphosis. And also on some of the soft-bodied adult shore forms, such as this mayfly. Some specimens are too small to be successfully pointed. These specimens should be prepared on microscope slides. The medium we will be using to mount the specimens on slide is called CMCP-10. It is a polyvinyl lactophenol product which makes it completely water soluble. The CMCP-10 should be dropped onto the center of the slide. The insect should then be picked up with a paintbrush or fine forceps and dropped into the center of the drop. Some attempt may be made to arrange the specimen on the slide, although this is seldom a particularly successful operation. An additional drop is now placed on top of the specimen to completely encase it in the CMCP. A cover slip is brought down over the drop at a 45 degree angle and lowered into position. This technique of slowly lowering the cover slip at an angle prevents the formation of air bubbles underneath the cover slip. Some specimens may be too thick to make an adequately stable mount in this manner. In these cases, one needs to build up an underlay of glass. Taking a cover slip, we wrap it in Kleenex and break it up into small shards. These shards will then be placed around the specimen and will support the cover slip at a small distance above the slide. This will prevent the specimen from becoming coming crushed. The shards of cover slip are embedded in the CMCP-10 medium. The cover slit is again set on edge and dropped slowly over the specimen. Very slight pressure is applied to squeeze out the additional med uh, medium.
Here is a specimen of a flea correctly mounted. For a specimen to have scientific value, it is essential that data be associated with it. The specimen must be labeled. The most important is the collecting label. This is the first one you should apply to the specimen. This label will list the location of capture as precisely as can be fitted onto the label. The date of capture, this should take the form of day, month, year, the month either abbreviated or written as a Roman numeral with day and year in Arabic. Finally, this should bear the collector's name. We are having you prepare these labels in pencil rather than in ballpoint ink or any other non-archival medium. The second label you will be applying to the specimen will be the identification label. This one you obviously will not be able to apply until much later in the course, when you have learned how to identify the insect. These are the appropriate labels for applying to the cricket, which was the first specimen we saw pinned. The labels are cut from the label sheet. They will be set on the pin using the pinning block. You will recall that the block has three sides, allowing three different levels that the specimen could be located. First, the collecting label, that with the collecting location, date, and collector's name, is mounted on the pin, and the middle height of the pinning block is selected. The pin is inserted in the normal manner in the block, and the label is correctly mounted on the pin. For the second label, the pin is once again placed through the center of the label. And using the lowest level of the pinning block, the identification label is set to the correct height. This second label may contain also a variety of other information about host plant, weather condition, or any other relevant matters. But in your case, this information will be attached to your field notes and the second label reserved exclusively for identification. Although these labels are centered on the pin, with pointed specimens, the label is offset so that the label is centered under the specimen. This only applies to pointed specimens. Pinned insects and even directly glued diptera should have the label centered. For the wet-mounted specimens, those in alcohol, the labels are prepared in the same manner. For wet-mounted specimens, it is essential that you use pencils, since most other media will tend to dissolve in the alcohol. The collecting and identification label are left joined together. If the labels are separated, there's a tendency for them to float together, and by Murphy's Law, they will always come together with a writing to the inside, so that the information is unreadable without removing the label from the vial and physically separating them. In this case, I've chosen to write the two labels one above the other. However, just as easily, they could have gone to the left and right. In this case, the identification label would appear here. The labels are cut from the label sheet. The pair of labels is slightly curved to fit inside the vial. The label is inserted. The alcohol level is brought back up to minimize the size of the air bubble inside. This results in a properly labeled wet-mounted specimen. 
slides use a standard slide label. In this particular instance, we have used a computer-generated label. These are permissible for all specimens, provided the labels can be printed small enough. These, then, are the basic techniques that you need to know to prepare your insect collection. Direct pinning of specimens, the pointing of small specimens, the spreading of butterflies and moths so that the wings can be fully examined, the preservation of soft-bodied insects in fluid, and the preparation of very small insects on microslides. The collection you produce should be neatly laid out, grouped by order, and the individual families identified on the pin associated with the specimen. The dry specimens, correctly mounted and correctly spread, should be presented in the pinning box that is provided. No micro slides or wet prepared specimens should be in this box. These can be presented in some other imaginative way, but on no account should they be in the box where they could roll around and do damage to the dry, brittle specimens. This, then, would be an example of a good, well-presented collection.